Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. My name is Liam and if you'd ask me to tell you the value of pi to seven decimal places, then I would say no. And today we are here to specifically talk about a little known arc that I and everyone else likes to call Wano. Specifically the wide array of incredibly mysterious plot threads that are currently dangling dangerously off the edge of the narrative. Because Oda has set up a ton of intriguing questions that we now have to answer. Or at least I hope we have to answer them because sometimes, you know, we don't do that. Yes, I'm looking at you, Thriller Bark, Monster, or you, Mysterious Moon Hieroglyphics, or even you, Person in Hat Drinking with Crocodile. Whatever. None of those are particularly relevant to Wano, and actually, just think about it, that's not true. The person in the hat is clearly related to Wano because they're dressed entirely in Wano gear, but I'm sure we've talked about that elsewhere. Today, I am more concerned with arc specific questions, things that need to be resolved within Wano itself, rather than the grand scheme of One Piece as a whole. And to begin this video discussion thing, we're going to start off with a quick round of King, Queen, or Jack, a very simple mini game, the rules of which are as follows. I am going to draw a card from this here deck, and it is going to be your job to guess whether that card will end up being a king, queen, or a jack. Should you guess incorrectly, then your punishment will be to subscribe to the Grand Line Review, which will also result in consistent injections of One Piece culture administered straight into your YouTube feed. Meanwhile, if you are correct, then you will be given a pair of horns and inducted into the Beast Pirates to serve Lord Kaido for all eternity. So which will it be, king, queen, or jack? Make your choice now and we shall reveal the answer in three, two, one and bam, it's a Jack. Also known as the most disappointing of face cards as well as the most disappointing of Kaido's calamities. So if you said king or queen, then you know a thing to do and please do say hi in the comments below if you are a new member of the Grand Fleet, welcome. But if you did land on king, then I don't blame you because he all on his own presents a veritable gift basket of Wano intrigue. First and foremost, we still have no idea what his race is. King is a member of this mystery faction of the One Piece world, one which is heavily implied to be potentially extinct. I mean, it's quite vague in the English translation, Big Mom states, there are still three races that I don't have in my country yet. One of them might have been lost in the mists of time, but you're still alive. The you're being King in this situation. Essentially implying that King may be the sole survivor of whatever brand of creature he hails from. Creatures that have black wings and this perpetual halo of fire burning brightly right behind their heads, which is one of the most unpleasant characteristics I could think of. Just have my neck, you know, constantly on fire. I mean, maybe that's why King does wear his gimp suit. Maybe it's heat resistant or something. Speaking of his outfit though, that's our secondary King mystery. His outfit is eerily evocative and perhaps even a straight up reference to Impel Down. When comparing King to Magellan and Shiryu, these three share a very similar aesthetic with this professional dark full body garb. And while King does not have the Impel Down coat of arms on himself as the others do, he does have these two square patches featuring a skull. Very intriguing because this exact same symbol can be found on the arm and collar of Shiryu. You. So at this point, there is next to no doubt that King has a connection to Impel Down in some way, shape or form. Whether that means he was a former warden or even killed a former warden and decided that yes, that outfit looks cool and took it, this is definitely something that demands answering. And just to cap off the King before Wano ends, we also need to know his bounty. At this point, Jack, Queen and even Kaido's delicious numberos have been revealed, but for whatever reason, Oda has decided to keep King's exact bounty in the dark, potentially to be revealed at some sort of combat-based dramatic moment, so give me that number. But King is a mere one character of Wano, and if nothing else, you could describe this arc as quite charactersome. There's an awful lot of people doing an awful lot of different things, and while a lot of that can be hard to keep up with, others are deliberately hidden from us. For example, hello Hiori, what you up to? Ah, you won't tell me. Hmm. Fine, be that way, I didn't wanna know anyway. Hiori is such a strange character because for as goofy and as emotional as she can be, Hiori seems to act with a very strong sense of purpose. At the time of this recording, we have not knowingly seen Hiori since the end of act two, where she rather weirdly stated that she refused to meet with Kinemon and the others in order to avoid distracting them with frivolous feminine related sentiment. I mean, she didn't say that last part, but she may as well have. So we have two options here. Either Hiori is sitting in Ringo, just, you know, fingers crossed that everyone else is doing all of the work for her, or Hiori has her own secret agenda to assist the raid. I mean, I personally think it would be incredibly unsatisfying for her to just sit out the climax and rock up at the end and go, you know, hey, good job, guys. I'm glad I wasn't there to distract you. Plus, I do find it very intriguing that Hiori has effectively refused to show herself to any of the characters who traveled forward in time. She met Kawamatsu, Zoro, and obviously spent a lot of time with Denjiro, but due to, quote, sentiment, she does not want to present 
herself to Kinemon, Momonosuke, Kanjiro, and Raizo. Which, you know, cue the Toki conspiracy theories that I enjoy ever so much. But speaking of Toki, this is another thread that we need to solve. There is something very important we don't know about her and that point can be summed up with a rather simple word being why. Her motivations for traveling forward in time have been left completely in the dark. And now of every one or related mystery I'll be posing in this video, I will admit that this one might not necessarily have to be answered during this arc, just due to the fact that Toki and Odin are connected far more to the core of the One Piece meta story than any of us could have anticipated. But this isn't one of those things that we can just, you know, leave. Toki had a very clear intention with what she was doing, and I want to know what it was, which uh, I think it's a simple request. For something a bit less world shaking, we also have the question of the Kitetsu set. Many readers and watchers may have forgotten about this at this point, but very early on in Wano, we discovered the Nidai Kitetsu, the sibling sword of Zoro Sandai Kitetsu. And it can be very easy to dismiss its existence as just a bit of fun and flavor, continuing to build and expand that world we love so much. Except that in a really roundabout way, Oda made sure to have Luffy take the Nidai Kitetsu, seemingly simply for the purpose to have Zoro notice it for a second. And then later on at the tail end of act two, we have Zoro noticing it again for a second, even learning its name and its relationship to his own Kitetsu blade. All I'm gonna say is it isn't a mighty convenient that our Kitetsu set consists of exactly three swords and our swordsman, Mr. Zoro, happens to use exactly how many? One, three swords. Of course, what really threw me off is that Zoro did go on to inherit Enma, so there's currently no room for a second Kitetsu blade. And even if there was, the Wadoichi Monji is taking up the space for a third. Still, Still, the Nidai Kitetsu is a strange minor story thread, because other than show off that yes, it does indeed exist, there is very little reason for Oda to have taken it on this amazing journey that it went through. He could have just shown it at Tenguyama's place and been done with it. So it's just another one of those things to probably remember. As is the Kurizumi clan. This is one of the more disturbing aspects of Wano actually, and we've seen a lot of disturbing stuff on this island. However, this is the one part of the story that highlights that our supposed good guys may not actually be all that good after all. Because after a plot where the head of the Kurizumi clan poisoned his rival Daimyo in an attempt to position himself to be the next Shogun before Sukiyaki was born, we received a brutal, brutal massacre. Because this plot was discovered and as a result, the Kurizumi clan were purged by all. By which I do mean extraordinarily brutally hunted down and murdered. Even those who had no affiliation with the plot, like say Orochi and the other Kurizumi members who were children at the time. This is a pretty dark detail and it does leave the remaining families in very questionable positions positions, one of which are the Kozuki clan, who have been portrayed as the heroes of this Wano story, the stalwart rulers who have conducted themselves in a fair and prosperous manner at all times. Except for this tiny little massacre, but hey, nobody's perfect. Along with the Shimotsuki clan, who are responsible for founding Zoro's village, and even the Amatsuki clan, which Toki hails from. And of course, the others whose names I don't remember right now. But unlike the names of those families, this is a question we should not forget. These past ruling bodies, including our beloved Kozuki clan, were well and truly responsible responsible, or at the very least, criminally indifferent towards this massacre. And I don't know if that's something we're going to need to contend with during this arc going forward, but there is certainly another deep dark layer of Wano history that has been very underexplored. And attached to that layer is Kurizumi Higurashi, the old lady who was forced to flee Wano or else she too would have been massacred. In any case, she had a very curious transformation via the Mane Mane no Mi into a man who looks suspiciously like Golden Lion Shiki. And the anime has all but confirmed that this is indeed Shiki, because because they've now shown him during this time and young Shiki looks exactly like the man who Higurashi turns into. By the way, slight tangent, the anime is very worth watching right now if you're a manga only reader because they are starting to add all sorts of stuff that actually expands the canon story of One Piece. Like it's actually at the point where I'm watching the anime to keep up with canon events because they are dropping some pretty serious stuff in what is technically considered filler. In any case, I would love to know when and how Higurashi interacted with Shiki. One of the stronger thoughts is that she may have been part of the Rocks Pirates, which which also brings a connection to Kaido into the mix. But I imagine that it was no easy task to get close enough to touch Shiki in order to save his body into the memory of the Mane Mane no Mi. Unless Higurashi used her feminine wiles to uh, seduce the old Shiki, but uh, well, good luck getting that image out of your head. You're welcome. Continuing with mysteries now, Onimaru, we both need to figure out what you are and why you are, or more accurately why you were introduced into the story. Right now, Onimaru represents a very rare figure of One Piece, which is the potential of legit legitimate supernatural powers, by which I mean magic-y sort of stuff, because he is a komagitsune that is able to shapeshift into a human form known as Yukimaru. And it really cannot be overstated just how weird this is even for One Piece. Magical creatures, they just don't exist. Sure, we have a bunch of weird stuff
stuff like cowfish, panda fish, even fish fish, but not even sea kings have these strange magical powers. It's just Onimaru right now, which brings up the possibility that he is a devil fruit user because, well, that's how these questions are usually answered. And Wano is a huge hotspot for unexplained devil fruit consumption. Another sub mystery is that we still have no idea how Kinemon and Raizo even got their devil fruits. At the moment, they're just completely normal during the flashbacks and then after traveling forward in time, they are now fruit users all of a sudden, which is great, but tell me how and when and why. Next up, we're going to cover some manga mysteries, by which I mean these are questions that cannot be asked without spoiling Act 3 of Wano for those of you who are not caught up. This basically means anime only watches. I mean, sorry guys, but it's hard to make a video like this without addressing these. If you wanna watch something else that's fun, here's a video, I promise it'll be great. But for everyone else, we are going to move on. First big thing we need to know, who was that mysterious entity eavesdropping on Jinbei and Robin? That's something I frequently forget ever happened because it was just that one ominous panel and then it was never referenced again. But here we clearly have someone lurking in the bushes, just observing like a voyeur. And many people have jumped to a ton of retrospective conclusions with this, like perhaps it was Yamato watching the Straw Hats, which sure, that does make some sense, but nothing has been explicitly stated yet. So the options are wide open for almost anything to happen. Be this person, Hiori, carrying out whatever it is she may or may not be doing, or something more absurdist like Toki keeping a watchful eye on the future, or even a character we have yet to meet or one that we do know and don't realize is on Onigashima as of yet. It was just a really weird panel. And to join it, we also have the companion silhouette from chapter 1004. I don't wanna talk about this too much because I bring it up a lot, perhaps even to death during chapter reviews, but this whole Kanjiro Odin thing was a huge red herring to take our attention away from whoever this is. This is a big question and it could very well be the same person who was watching Robin and Jinbei because the silhouettes, they match as much as a silhouette can when you see almost nothing of them. Basically, this person appears to be wearing a dark cloak, which, well, it fits the tiny morsels of aesthetic information that we have available to us. Back to Yamato though, man, there's a lot to unravel here, Yamato possesses Odin's journal, which clearly contains some wild information, including whatever it is that has led Yamato to believe that Momonosuke is the one who is going to bring about the dawn of the world. A role that was previously assumed to be held by Luffy going from Pedro's whole cake hunch. That's a big one. And following the action-packed climax of Wano, I think that we should be ready for some series changing information spawning directly from the mouth of Yamato. Meanwhile, one factor that still heavily eludes this arc is the location of Kaido's road poneglyph. We've examined and not one but two funky square rocks on Wano now, one found by Brook in Orochi's castle, and one kept in the basement of Onigashima discovered by Law. Neither of which is the road poneglyph that we sorely need before leaving this island. That is pretty non-negotiable. And one of the major reasons why we're on Wano in the first place is simply to pick up this information. So where is this thing if not in Orochi's castle or Kaido's stronghold? And just as a side note, it is interesting that Kaido keeps all of his poneglyphs separate. I suppose at the very least that does present a big momening from happening here, where one breach results in the theft of all poneglyphs. But now, Basil Hawkins. Another question that may or may not have been lost in all of this recent raid hype is who is the 1% man? In chapter 990, Hawkins stated that the chances of a certain man surviving until tomorrow were a mere 1%. And just like any time we see a shadow or a silhouette, the possibilities are almost frustratingly numerous. Common interpretations include Luffy, perhaps Kaido, and even the startling idea of Diaz Drake, who Hawkins was speaking to at the time. Maybe acting as some sort of tragic foreshadow shadowing for Drake's future within this raid. But to explore this idea some more, I've made an entire video discussing who the 1% man could be. Very interesting stuff. So I look forward to seeing you there.